Dr. Ken Cole very, very much for taking time to uh, join us today and, and present some of the, the work that he's doing as part of the, the National Institutes of uh, Standards and Technology. And he's located in Gaithersburg at their main campus. Um, Ken is a leader of the, the Biomarkers uh, and Genomic Science Group at NISC. Um, he got his PhD in biochemistry at Texas Tech, and uh, he studied bilirubin uh, metabolism, and then went on to do postdocs in molecular biology at the University of South Carolina, uh, where he studied rat spermatogenesis, and the University of Arizona, uh, studying insect metamorphosis. Um, he started working at the National Institutes of Standards in Boulder, Colorado, where He's worked on measurement standards for various projects, including bioprocessing, biodefense, cell line authentication. And uh, I got to know Ken uh, as part of the efforts he's involved in in uh, cancer biomarkers. And I've had the, the honor of working with Ken on several joint projects with his group and, and uh, folks at Frederick National Labs. and. Uh, uh, we've re resulted in, in several, I, I think, very nice publications introducing uh, things like copy number uh, uh, reference materials for next-gen sequencing and droplet digital PCR applications. Um, Ken is a wonderful guy. He's a great collaborator and uh, runs a really great show down there. And I'm excited, again, to uh, have him here today to present some of the work that he's doing. And uh, I would say when we get into discussion, uh, you know, open it up. Uh, let's keep it really informal. And uh, knowing that Ken and his group are great collaborators, if anything pops to your mind that would be of interest, uh, feed it his way because uh, he, he's surveying the field for unmet needs. Not that he can do everything, but uh, certainly making him aware of areas that uh, could be of interest uh, for further discussion would be a great outcome from today. But with that, Ken, I'm going to pass it back to you and we'll let you get right into it. And again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Um, yeah, I, I mean, um, today um, I'm going to give you an overview of our, our program and it sort of be at a higher level, a little bit of data, uh, but it'll be uh, informal and, and questions, I think, you know, I could handle them right um, w when they occur to you. So, so feel free to ask. Um, so, you know, I'm going to give a little overview of the structure of, of, of our group, um, some of our work on copy number uh, standards, um, liquid biopsy measurements, um, more recently working on methylated DNA markers, and what we're calling the 21st century cell lines for for uh, reference materials, and then some some next steps and our collaborators. Um, so the group is sort of organized by four teams. Um, there's a team called Quantitative Flow Cytometry. Um, there's a consortium that's just a member of number of stakeholders that get together with common goals and help direct research at NIST. And that's led by Lily Wang, uh, the genome editing standards. And there's also a consortium, and that team is led by Samantha Mara. And the human genomics team, um, also there's also a consortium called Genome in a Bottle, led by Justin Zook. And I, I think Justin talked to you a few months ago. Uh, the cancer biomarkers team, um, uh, there's an interagency agreement with NCI, and Wajun He is the uh, leader of that team. So, real, real briefly here, uh, the quantitative flow cytometry uh, program led by Lily Wang. Um, the goals are to develop uh, biological reference materials, data, and methods, and uh, for for achieving quantitative flow cytometry. Um, it's been notoriously very hard to standardize, but uh, Lily's got a lot of efforts in that way to 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 make flow cytometry more 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 quantitative. Uh, they do a measurement called the equivalent number of reference fluorophores, um, and these can be used to calibrate beads to to help standardize flow cytometer. 
Um, she works on applications and biomarkers for immuno-oncology and other diseases, um, extracellular vesicles associated with cancer um, uh, detection and, and, and monitoring, CRISPR-Cas engineered cells, and also some of you may know her through um, a collaboration with the NCI um, to do serology of COVID-19 antibodies um, with the National Serology Science Network. Um, she's also doing some cutting edge research on single molecule detection using, um, they're calling a quantum uh, cytometer with, with, with the physics lab. The uh, Genome Editing Consortium um, organized and led by Samantha Murat um, it's to bring the stakeholders together to address the measurements and standards needed to achieve uh, confidence in genome editing technology uh, used in research right now. Um, the, the, it's organized as three working groups. The first group is actually to do specificity measurements and develop uh, physical materials and benchmark measurements for assays that measure off target and on target um, genome editing. The second group uh, is to develop standards for um, expressing the data and metadata associated with these types of experiments. And the third group is for uh, to standardize, uh, harmonize the uh, lexicon used in uh, genome editing uh, type research. Um, Justin uh, talked to you, um, you know, a few months ago, and it's been a great success for NIST. It's called the Genome in a Bottle Consortium. Um, it's an open consortium uh, to bring together all the stakeholders that do um, human genome sequencing and to provide benchmark data and, and NIST reference materials. They have five, uh, we have five different um, NIST reference materials, including three trios. Um, and, and these are used to basically assign the, um, the 6 billion base uh, pairs in, in a human genome um, and use uh, different technologies and more, more recently, such as AI and machine learning to help ex assess the, um, how these different uh, sequencing technologies work. Um, there's been a very, very large number of downloads of genome 18,000 um, a year uh, for the data and over 50 commercial products produced from uh, the reference, the NIST reference materials that were actually formed through um, uh, a collaboration with the Personal Genome Project and Coriel Institute for Medical Science. So these these are uh, B cell lymphoblastoid cell lines um, available at Coriel, and the, the reference materials are actually the genomic DNA produced from these. So th this is a this is a reprint that's received a lot of attention lately. Um, it's called the complete sequence of the human genome, um, and it's received a lot of uh, media uh, attention. And it's finally that the human genome back in 2001 was was announced to be complete. Well, they didn't really weren't, it really wasn't completed. They so this telomere to telomere consortium has has focused on the re, remaining eight percent of the DNA that was um, that was not fully characterized. And I'm just going to read off the uh, the the uh, preprint. It uh, provides a gapless assemblies for all 22 autosomes, including chromosome X, corrects numerous errors, and in introduces 200 million base pairs of novel sequence carrying, uh, containing 2,226 paralogous gene copies. So it's quite an accomplishment, and Jean Justin's team was 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 on you know among many authors on this uh, preprint uh, shown here. The uh, Cancer Biomarker Program, uh, led by Dr. Uh, Wajun He, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, materials for copy number measurements. Um, uh, an interagency agreement we have with the uh, NCI and the Early Detection Research Network, uh, focused on projects mainly for liquid biopsy. And 
these include the, the current projects we're working on are circulating tumor DNA, uh, DNA methylated markers um, in liquid biopsy, and standards for extracellular vesicles, um, again, for, for liquid biopsy measurements of early detection of cancer. We also have a project with the foundation NIH um, to test QC materials for, for circulating tumor DNA from different manufacturers. And again, the 21st century cell line projects and I'll give you a little more details on all of these. So first NIST focuses on the, the measurement science to achieve confidence and reproducibility and analytical measurements. And we do this in different ways, including um, interlaboratory testing, developing test materials, and ex an external validation of, of assays that other people um, provide us and samples, or we can sometimes develop assays in our, in our own labs, um, and the development of reference materials and data when, when it's needed. So we focus in on the analytical validation, which is relatively easy. Uh, before you get to the very difficult stage of clinical validation that uh, is faced with the biological variability of, of, of human samples. So standard reference material um, 2373 was made from five different breast cancer cell lines with different degrees of uh, HER2 amplification. And it was the certified values were determined at NIST using uh, droplet digital PCR and quantitative PCR. We also looked at the protein expression and we plan on looking at RNA um, in this in these standards. Um, the, this 2373 was used to, to validate copy numbers with uh, um, NGS and Mickey was a very great uh, gracious collaborator to work with us in the, the whole Mo uh, Mocha, Mocha lab. Uh, did a number of um, next generation sequencing uh, methods on these materials. And this graph shows the five breast cancer genomic DNA standards, A through E, um, and the, the, the data from uh, the uh, whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing analyzed by three different algorithms, and amplicon sequencing compared to the NIST uh, certified values. And, and it showed um, very good agreement uh, between the between the certified values and the, the various NGS assays. And this was published in 2016. Um, NIST reference material 8366 was developed to provide copy number measurements standards for EGFR and MET. Um, and this slide shows the, um, just in this case, we use droplet digital PCR to measure the levels of MET, epidermal growth factor, and HER2 in six different um, cancer cell lines from, from different tissues. Again, Mickey was a great collaborator with the MOCA lab and um, also validated the, the copy number measurements in these uh, reference materials. And that was published in 2019 paper uh, shown at the bottom. Okay, so I, I mentioned liquid biopsy, and that's kind of the latest um, catchword in, in in early detection is to use um, you know biological fluids to measure cancer biomarkers for, for potentially early detection of cancer when it's the most treatable. Uh, and this slide shows the source of, of some of these biomarkers, whether it's active secretion of, of extracellular vesicles into the blood or um, apoptosis or necrosis, uh, dying of cancer cells and releasing um, targets such as DNA or RNA or, uh, uh, you know, with various mutations, including uh, methylation of, of the DNA markers or such things as copy number measurements um, or structural changes or, or mutations. So the slide shows the um, potential of, of liquid biopsy. Uh, we did a, an interlab 
testing uh, program of a commercial product made by Seracare containing um, circulating tumor DNA uh, reference material and with 40 variants. And uh, this sl slide just shows some of the labs that were the collaborators in it, including um, Tony Godfrey, who's a member of the EDRN, it studies uh, Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer. cancer. Uh, Mickey's lab um, at, at Frederick and uh, Margaret Gully's lab at the uh, University of North Carolina and Michael Goggins at uh, Johns Hopkins, who studies pancreatic cancer. Um, Sarah Care, the manufacturer, did digital PCR and we did also digital PCR on these uh, 40 variants and uh, the company Assurge and also did an NGS assay. So, um, it was very useful to compare the different technologies for the measurements of these uh, 40 variants, and that was published in, in 2019 in the paper shown on the bottom of the, the slide. This slide shows a, um, a foundation um, NIH sponsored project um, to develop uh, quality control materials for circulating uh, tumor DNA uh, as part of their biomarkers consortium. And this project was led by Bob McCormack and, and Mickey Williams. And it's a partnership of the private and public sectors and shows the many moving parts and all the stakeholders in this project. Um, there are four analytical validation labs, including the MOCA lab, um, NIST did digital PCR, uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Dana Farber uh, also were, were, were doing the, the, the validation and uh, the organization of this project. Um, we've completed phase one, which was actually the analytical um, measurements of the, the three uh, reference materials produced, or excuse me, quality control materials produced from the three manufacturers. And that was published um, just recently in JCO uh, Precision Oncology. Um, phase two is is, is ongoing. Um, it's organized uh, by Chris Karlovich, and phase three is in planning stages and organization for actually uh, testing of a clinical pilot of the materials with different um, analytical uh, lab. Uh, clinical labs to, to see how well they work as controls. So this is a, a pretty exciting, um, very, you know, encompassing many stakeholders um, involved in this project. This slide just shows the strategy um, that we developed at NIST for, for making spike in reference materials for, for liquid biopsy. And we take a synthetic approach where we um, get a uh, plasmid made with synthetic DNA insertion for um, a number. You can have as many, well, you can have within reason many uh, mutations produced in tandem, uh, the sequences and restrict, uh, separated by a restriction enzyme. And if you digest the plasmid with a restriction enzyme, it will release the fragments in. Um, in equal molar amounts um, to allow us to to develop controls by mixing these DNA fragments with physically sheared background uh, DNA, such as from the one of the genome in a bottle reference genomes, and it's been very helpful for us to do the analytical validation of our assays for um, a number of the uh, circulating tumor DNA, and we've shared. It with with other labs um, to allow them to to have a, a positive control or, or a reference material. So one of the challenges we've been tasked with by the uh, EDRN is to develop um, standards for for DNA methylation, and so the DNA methylation is occurring early in, in tumor genesis and occurring over a large number 
of, of genes and it allows you to have multiple targets. Uh, and it also, the pattern of DNA methylation is, is related to the, the cellular function of the cell. So you can actually look at the fingerprint uh, of the DNA methylation and, and get information about the cell of origin uh, of the tumor um, when you're me measuring it. But it, it's, it's a difficult thing to measure and it's, it's proving to be difficult to make reference materials for it. Uh, most of the measurement methods for methylation revolve around using um, either bisulfite or enzymatic conversion of the methyl cytosines to uracil, and then using some kind of sequencing method or PCR method to measure the converted compared to the, you know, original um, material. And so, uh, you know, there's a number of ways you can do this, but uh, it, it is a challenge to produce these materials and to do accurate sequencing of the methylated DNA. So um, some of the approaches that we're, we're working on right now, uh, we wanna use the genome in a bottle human uh, reference material because it's so very well characterized. And we've, we've picked a couple uh, test targets with collaborators in the EDRN, um, including a gene called EVL, um, with, in collaboration with Bill Brady at, at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, and uh, who, who studies colon cancer risk, and two genes called CCNA1 and VIM, or, or Vimentin, uh, DNA methylation in collaboration with uh, Sandy Markowitz uh, at Case Western for, for Barrett, Barrett's esophagus. And we want to develop uh, materials we can use to, you know, test how well we're doing uh, in, in producing uh, standards for, for methylation. So the approach, the, one of the approaches we're taking is to do in vitro methylation. So there's an enzyme in which you can convert um, uh, cytosine to methyl cytosine um, in, in vivo, in vitro. And so we've taken one of the genome in a bottle uh, reference materials and done in, in vitro hypermethylation and mixed it with the native state um, genome material uh, to reproduce various uh, fractions of, of methylate, hypermethylated DNA. And this slide shows some of the materials we've, we've done blends of. Um, the, the graph on the top, you can see my arrow, basically shows the correlation of our blend of, of methylation determined by um, uh, reduced representation by sulfide sequencing. So that's a, that's a way to analyze a fraction of the GC-rich genomic material. Doesn't get all of it, but it gets you a, um, a fraction of the GC-rich uh, genomic material, about around 50%. Um, and then we've used uh, di droplet digital PCR assays to confirm uh, the blends we've made and the graphs on the bottom show the degree of um, of unmethylated in the solid bars uh, to for various blends we've produced for the CCNA1 and the EVL gene, um, and you can see that in the native in the zero percent hypermethylated blend, very little of this gene is actually methylated, but we can produce you know. 100% uh, methylation by, by blending the two uh, materials. And this, this slide just shows um, a digital PCR assay for the, this, in this case, it's the CCNA1 gene. And so we, we have an amplicon for this, this, um, this gene that we're measuring the methylation on, and we use either a probe for the methylated um, methylated state or the unmethylated state, so this this shows the two um, forms of conversion uh, 
we're using in this case. Oops. Go back. Sorry. Um, in this case, we're using two either an enzymatic conversion or or the or a bisulfite conversion for some some of the material we've made. In this case, we've uh, the the methylated DNA um, using the enzymatic enzymatic conversion is much stronger. This is the this is the positive droplets here. Uh, compared to the bisulfite conversion, and, and it's known that bisulfite is very harsh chemical reaction that it it shears the DNA and also um, chemically degrades it. So the the enzymatic conversion is is, is superior, although but telling from people in the lab, they told me though it takes longer and it's more steps, but it but it is more more efficient on the DNA detection. So, um, and then this this slide over here shows the the unmethylated uh, controls. So again, this slide shows some of the strategies for for uh, producing uh, circulating tumor DNA uh, methylated standards. In this case, we want to produce them in a size fractionated um, manner uh, to, to simulate the, the cell-free DNA in, in, in blood. And we can you know, do this blending in the hypermethylation stage um, that I just uh, explained the approach with. Uh, another approach um, we're considering is taking cell-free DNA from a patient and doing whole genome amplification um, and making the materials from that, that has the advantage of having 0% methylation in the starting material. And we don't really know whether it's a problem yet because there's always a native or basal degree of methylation in the, in the genomic material that we're preparing from cell lines. So th this might have an advantage on some genes. We haven't really, I, I, I mentioned the genes we've done the modeling on. Um, they, they are all unmeth unmethylated in the native state and they become methylated in the, in the cancer state. But, um, you know, this may not be true for, for everything. Uh, we just have to, to do interlabs and we're planning on um, Right now, we're doing planning on doing interlabs to, to determining the suitability of this hypermethylation blending of the the genome in a bottle reference material, and we also have a, a cooperative research and development agreement with Seracare to um, produce these materials once we have uh, you know have some data from the interlabs to determining to determine what's the best approach to use. Um, another, you know, liquid biopsy we're very interested in because the EDR, EDRN um, has asked us to work on standards for extracellular vesicles, and this this is um, some of the work by by Lily Wang, in which she's using um, different physical methods to characterize um, extracellular vesicles, such as field flow fractionation, cryo EM. Uh, at flow cytometry and other particle count counters, these the have to get down to um, there. There's there's various sizes of extracellular vesicles. Some are as small as 30 nanometers, and some are you know in the hundreds uh, of nanometer sizes. And so we need a variety of, of very sensitive methods to go to that low to count particles that small. And so Lily is also developing some some simulants for um, uh, size calibration or extracellular vesicles based on um, mainly flow cytometry um, in this case. So and also in the future we're planning on you know looking at the payload markers um, for the extracellular vesicles and, and the proteins and 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 RNA targets as as those biomarkers become. Uh, of interest. 
Okay, and I mentioned the, the cell lines. Um, cell lines are, are really important for us to develop a renewable source of uh, materials that we can use to share with, with other, other labs. Um, and, and cell lines have been the workhorse since, you know, since the 50s uh, when they were first developed for human uh, cancer. Um, and there's, there's thousands of cell lines available and they do allow you sharing materials across laboratories. And the technology is fairly worked out in, in many applications. Only the, the downside of cells is um, the secret life of cells are that they can be frequently misidentified or contaminated. Um, if you passage them too long in culture, you can get genetic and, and phenotypic drift. In many cases, so these historical cell lines have uncertain provenance. Um, and they, in many cases, they lack normal um, matching cells to know what the starting material was. And um, also, in many cases, they lack or have only partial donor consent. And especially for the types of NGS data that it would be desirable to publish, you really want to make sure that the, the materials have been well consented. Um, and a number of and cell lines can suffer from overpassaging, serial propagation, and, and sharing of cell lines, which are behavioral issues. So, in particular, cell cancer cell lines have suffered from chromosomal instability in many cases. Uh, they're frequently aneuploid and heteroploid. Um, frequent mutations in the p53 gene that is responsible for uh, you know chromosomal st um, stability, um, and they've been selected for growth in plastic dishes, um, in a, and and growth media on, on artificial conditions that can select for growth and and lead to loss of differentiation and, and phenotypic expression. So our goals are to replace the historical cell lines with uh, cell lines that are fully consented, and we know uh, the whole history of the cell lines, and it will allow us to um, provide tissues from, from normal and the, the tumors uh, to have matched tissues to allow us what is the you know, the starting genomic background of the materials. Um, and we want to make them public, available from public repositories without IP issues, um, and they enable labs and companies to develop products from these cell lines um, and taking advantage of extensive uh, data that we plan on uh, collecting. So, you know, these cell lines would provide us with a full annotation of the cells, how they were established and such information as the history of the the, the patients. Um, we can look at different methods methods of immortalization um, and having the match normals, the looking at um, the time zero uh, for for characterization of the of the genomic background of the materials. Um, and we plan on doing extensive characterization through uh, collaborations such as Genome in a Bottle, and the cell line should be free of IP issues um, from the originator or the repository. <clears throat> so we've entered a partnership with Andy Liss at Massachusetts General. A Andy runs a um, pancreatic tumor bank. Um, besides doing research on, on pancreatic cancer, and they have um, a large number of samples, um, including blood and uh, besides the, the the tumor samples and the, the medical history of the patients. So this was from Andy's proposal um, and, the, and the overall goals are to establish cancer cell lines from pancreatic tumors and also to mortalize cell cultures of non-malignant cells for, to provide matched patient samples. So this 
and, and more recently, we've been talking to Andy about precancer um, because of our, you know, the interest of the EDRN in early detection of cancer um, in the precancer state. So this slide just shows some of the histological change and genetic changes that occur in going from the epithelial to, um, you know, adenocarcinoma in the pancreas. And there are, um, you know, precancer states. And one of them that we're interested in is this, they're called IPMN cells, which are introductal papillary uh, mucinous uh, neoplasms. And so Andy is interested in uh, making uh, cancer, precancer models from these cell lines. So these are some of the things we have planned with Andy are to take blood uh, for the the uh, matching normal of uh, the B cell lymphoblastoid cell lines, um, the ductal carcinoma cell, uh, cell lines, precancerous from the IPMN um, materials, and also have uh, normal tissues from, from fibroblasts. So this is ongoing with Andes, and he showed us, uh, sent us a picture of one of the candidate cell lines that is going on in his lab now, and we hope to have, you know, cell lines in in the next year or so that we can begin characterization on and, um, you know, making materials. Uh, and so these are some of the plans we have for those cells um, to measure the genomic, epigenomic, and protein changes um, from tumor and normals. And we can look at the effect of culture conditions, including time and you know the effect of media. Um, we can look at different methods for memorialization and characterizing these materials through um, genome in a bottle type consortiums and possibly transcriptomic uh, studies in the future. Um, and the the normal cells will be very useful for many potential applications as normal uh, tissues. Um, these are some of the next steps for planning, um, continuing the methylation standards and investigating ways to scale up the process for making cell-free DNA sized uh, materials, which are in the range of 130 to 160 base pairs, just depends on the type of cancer and the patient's um, variability. Um, we want to do uh, planning, we're planning analytical validation of a, of a measurement method called eFIRM, which is electronic uh, chip method for measuring cell-free DNA in collaboration with uh, David Wong at UCLA. This has some very you know, intriguing results from this method. Um, including me me measurement of uh, cell-free DNA markers in saliva. Um, test materials in, for RNA, since those are you know, turning out to be very important, such as gene fusions and messenger RNAs in vesicles. Um, Lily's working on methods for uh, counting uh, extracellular vesicles and phenotyping using nanoparticle probes and uh, collaboration with the Prostate Center for Disease uh, disease um, at the, um, at the um, our, uh, Uniform Services uh, Health Center um, for, for vesicles, uh, including RNA-associated um, proteins uh, from urine and, uh, and serum uh, for prostate cancer. So um, I want to mention our collaborators, which you know it's it's very important for us to be able to to work uh, because you know we 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 specialize in analytical measurements and we really have to have these collaborations. It's very important um, to have our uh, stakeholders so we know we're we're working on the on the correct problems. Um, in the EERN, um, Matt Young and Lynn Sorbera uh, and Sudhir Sarvastava um, have been very helpful and supportive of us with the interagency agreements. Uh, Mickey Williams and Chris and the MOCA team have been very, very great collaborators. 
uh, Sarah Care, uh, Russell Garlick, and Yves Konishofer. We've had several creatives with them to develop uh, materials together. Uh, I mentioned David Wong with the eFirm uh, measurement and the Foundation NIH Biomarker Consortium uh, reference um, quality control materials. Mickey and Bob McCormack and, and Dana Connors and team and Andy Liss with the development of the, uh, the 21st century cell lines. And these are the people at NIST that, that work on the project, including uh, Justin and Wajun and uh, Lily Wang. Um, so I think that's the last one I have. So if there are any questions. Thank you, Ken. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask everybody to jump in and uh, ask away, but uh, maybe, I might ask, you didn't mention anything directly in, in proteomics. Are you, do you have anything on the drawing board or are you open to hearing areas? Obviously, proteomics is moving along and, and, and moving toward clinical applications. Um, and, and I'm speaking of multi-analyte proteomics, not uh, things like IHCs, but any uh, activity in that space? Um, yeah, we have a lot of interest in it, and actually NIST does do a lot of um, mass spectrometry uh, for, like, clinical targets, but um, kind of the multiplexed, um, you know, analysis you're talking about, I, no one's really doing that at NIST, and so I think we're looking for outside collaborators. If, you know, Lily's working on the, the, the EVs, and, and that's going to be a big Biological markers are the proteins in the EVs. Um, our group sort of specializes on the nucleic acid, so we're going to be heavily dependent upon proteomics with outside collaborators. So, yeah, we'd be, you know, very open to hearing about, you know, possible people we can work with and, you know, um, the targets. But right now, the that comes to mind is sort of the extracellular vesicles or I mean, it's a fascinating um, process that these uh, vesicles can be directed to specific tissues. And so it's, um, you know, it's, I mean, I think there's a lot of interest in that. And yep, yep. the, the okay, EDRN, yeah, right. Yeah, Dr. Wang, folks, it's open uh, forum right now, so please jump in. All right, so in the interim, I'll, I'll keep asking questions, Ken. Um, okay. How does your group actually entertain proposals and, and determine where you're going to go? I mean, we all have limited bandwidth, but is there a certain criteria that you're looking for in a project that would help you justify your engagement? Yeah, I think the great thing about um, consortiums and we're, we're forming more of those all the time is basically we get to, to gather everybody um, to in the same room to, you know, to determine what would be beneficial, you know, to, to aid the whole industry. You know, we can, we can enter into agreements with single companies and with, with Kratos, but, you know, we have to offer that, we we have to offer that uh, opportunity to any company that wants to do it, but it's usually with one company. And you know, sometimes we're working. We try not to work on a company specific product, but and all, all of the research we do, you know, is we have to publish it and put it out there for for the everyone's benefit. Um, but the consortiums basically allow us to kind of hear everybody's voice and, and try to figure out uh, pathways to benefit everybody in the industry and, you know, usually in the pre-competitive space, um, you know, so that's, 
you know, we, we have a number of consortiums. And so that that proven to be a very good way for us to um, find out what industry needs and, and work together with them, um, you know, and here companies like the, um, um, the FDA and, uh, you know, because, because the, the regulatory barriers, um, you know, right now um, we have a program in our division on um, CAR T. And so right now we're looking, we're hearing a lot of need on um, viral vectors for various things. And so we're, we're looking at potentially working on some standards for that. Uh, again, you'd have to be in a sort of neutral space for benefit the whole industry and not, you know, one company's product. So, yeah. and, and uh, another thing, you know, from my perspective, talking to the commercial end of quality control material manufacture, um, Obviously, this is not trivial. You need to have a product that is well characterized, vetted, and um, in an area of unmet need. Um, mm -hmm. But I hear from many of these commercial companies that they, they put all the time and the effort in. They get a product. They've worked with FDA consortia and, and NIST um, and various, you know, uh, commercial pharma companies and like, let's take the CTDNA, uh, QCMs. You do all the work, you publish the papers, and then laboratories will make their own material. And they, they claim that it's much cheaper to make our own uh, reference material, so to speak, and, and do our own rather than having to buy it from a company. It, this is a conundrum um, because, uh, again, how do you know what a private reference material looks like compared to somebody else's assay results? And when you're in clinical space and, and people are paying money uh, through insurance to cover the cost of these assays, many of them, how do we kind of convince the community at large that we need to use common materials and, and no, you know, again, reference ranges, calibrators. Um, mm -hmm. Some assays can be all over the place when you compare them to each other. And we saw that at the beginning of the CT DNA. So we're gonna provide these materials, but how do we convince assay labs that this is in their best interest to do it without having CMS and insurers say, we won't pay unless you use a, mm -hmm. an acceptable standard. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And NIST, NIST reference materials are very expensive and they traditionally take a long time to develop. And, and you know, we say we make higher order standards so that, um, you know, ideally it's, for us to make a higher order standard and to make people, uh, other labs to, to make their materials traceable to our materials is considered a big success. We don't really have to make money off the NIST materials. We try to recover some of the cost, but it's probably just a fraction of it. And so um, secondary uh, materials, uh, you know, the conversations we've been having with Saracare Russell wants to to have a material that they can make traceable to NIST, and so that 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 is a very laudable goal is to have, um, you know, that secondary standard producers making a, hopefully a material that most labs can afford and making it traceable to NIST, and so um, you know that's sort of the way the um, the human identity uh, labs work. They, I think, they're required by law to run the NIST standards, um, you know, a couple times a year. Um, but there are lots and lots of companies that make secondary materials that are are more affordable and uh, still still sufficient quality. Um, you know, so 
I, I know it's a temptation, but, you know, I mean, if they want to have certification, it seems like they really have to have real, um, you know, reference materials made by a, by an approved laboratory and not generate your own home version of the lab lab materials. But you no, know, we understand the cost limitations. Yeah. Yeah, so more or less a mandate. Jeff, uh, listen, I, I see you're on the call and I'm gonna pick on you right now because it's been a while since I've been engaged in uh, uh, HIV um, assays. But I, I know there's a WHO standard. Does everybody use that in their testing as far as calibration and the like, or is it still somewhat the wild west in, in uh, testing for uh, the HIV virus? I, I think it's somewhere in between, and it depends on the context of the testing. Oh, so we'll, let's go for clinical testing where somebody is gonna be told yes or no, uh, you have HIV and or if it's being used for monitoring therapy response in a clinical lab. Yeah, you know, Mickey, that's a space I don't really operate in these days. And so I'm not sure exactly what the current standards are or exactly what reference standard is required in a CLIA certified situation like that. Um, but uh, I'm sure there is one. Okay. If you want to talk about uh, non-human primate uh, samples, which is where we're spending most of our time these days uh, trying to deal with more fundamental issues and evaluate experimental uh, treatments and preventions and vaccines and things. We can talk all about the things we do there. Okay, and it, again, our laboratories that are in that level of research um, concerned about preparing after uh, and how uh, they do or... the, uh, uh, by way of your geographical analogy, I would say most of the labs in that space are west of the Rockies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Folks, any questions beyond what we've discussed? Yeah, Mickey, this is uh, this is Gordon Whiteley. Um, one of the things that uh, we always did in the diagnostics industry was try and trace back to WHO standards, um, you know, particularly for quantitative assays like HCG or LH or whatever. Um, is uh, Ken, are you working with WHO on providing materials uh, that could be used by companies. We used to use um, oh, standards, I think we got from Baxter way back when, but they were all traceable to WHO standards. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to be in the diagnostics industry where things were traceable to. And I know as different companies want to get into the um, space of providing uh, tests that are approved by the FDA, you, you have to have some kind of, of um, reference material provided for, um, for those tests. And I, the ones I've seen, I, I can't say that I've seen any that are traceable. Yeah, the, I think the WHO is very interesting. Um, most of the time, they, their, their biological controls are kind of, they, they pick arbitrary units and, you know, they make a big batch and it's made by um, usually NIBSC in the UK. And, and once that lot is gone, um, you know, you, you, you've lost um, that connection. You know, I think the, Metrology institutes like to make things standardized to, um, you know, well, in biology, it might be a mole or something, you know, molecules of, you know, instead of having a biological standard. So, but, it, but it's always good to, you know, and, and, and I think the WHO standards are hard to get, you know, for, for, for most labs, um, you have to be. 
on a select list of to get a WHO standard. And, and so some of the um, Lily's working on some serology standards uh, for COVID-19 and she really wants to make them quantitative to, you know, count molecules of antibody while the WHO standard will just be a big lot of, you know, maybe patient derived antibody material um, that once that's used up, Basically, you know, they'll call it a thousand units or something. Um, so, I mean, I think they 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 have we have kind of different goals to make higher order standards, but it it's certainly good to make your standard traceable to to the WHO uh, because of the high profile of those standards. And but you know, I think we does we. Um, and this would desire to, to to make them traceable to the what they call the SI um, units, you know, of, you know moles, liters, or kilograms, or whatever. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but we sort of have different goals. I mean, they are out. I understandably they're out to get uh, something out there in a hurry. Well, and this can fool around, and you know. Take a long time to develop an SI standard, but you know it'll have the advantage that it will be traceable to a, uh, a fundamental unit. Um, I think I think the problem with um, diagnostic companies when they use the and you're right the WHO standards you could only get one vial every X number of years, mm -hmm. and you had to trace things back to that. But um, every time they changed uh, lot numbers, they would have them sequential. So you would say your your test is traceable to the first WHO standard, and it was X number of international units. And um, that turned out in certainly in uh, immunoassays, quantitative immunoassays, to be very valuable. Uh, in trying to rein in the in industry so that every company didn't have their own definition of what a mm -hmm. <laughs> what of what a unit was, and um, I think in in genomics, it, it, I I agree it's kind of a wild west thing. And and one of the things that has changed dramatically is FDA approval for single laboratories. It, it's no longer right. a diagnostic company manufacturing a kit. It's, I'll, I'll name a name, Foundation Medicine is FDA approved next gen sequencing as a companion diagnostic uh, for approved drugs uh, in cancer. And it's a proprietary assay, proprietary standards. Um, nobody knows how they compare. Um, they, they've been very open and uh, collaborative in these public-private uh, cooperations, and uh, that, that's great. But again, you know, how do you trace back to foundation and approve test um, if you don't even know what they're doing? Well, and. and um... Over time, how do they trace to themselves? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> All righty, folks. We are scheduled to go into a round table. So Ken, um, technically we're in that period right now and I'm gonna go around. I don't wanna keep people longer than we need and ask if anybody has any further um, things that they would like to discuss. Otherwise, I, I will finish up by thanking you very much for the overview and uh, 